So, night two, G1 USA New Japan special was not as good as night one, period. Now, maybe part of it is the fact that I had to wait six days to watch night two. That could be it. But I know this show didn't need to be four fucking hours. Having four tag matches that have six men or more is stupid. Stupid. It's unnecessary. Between two nights, you should be able to figure out a way to get everybody booked that you need to get booked. Some of these cases, you didn't need to book them two nights. In some cases, maybe you didn't need to book these guys at all. Give them a payout to sit on the sidelines. This show should have been no more than maybe six matches, maybe seven at the very most, in two and a half to three hours. Sitting there and expecting people to always watch four hours for each of the nights for a big show. It gets so damn long and drawn out and frankly leads to the show feeling boring. Maybe more boring than it actually is. WWE does this with their big events. New Japan does this with their big events. ROH is notorious for doing this with some of their big events. Especially when it's just match, 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 match. And you don't have anything to break up the monotony of rep the repetitive match cycle. And they don't. The commentary was up and down throughout the night. You know, my thing with JR is, damn it, dude, they're paying you money to do a job. Do the job well. Educate yourself. Do some goddamn research. Because as a fan, I should be able to tune in and have the education provided by you. I should feel like you've done the research that I need to be able to help disseminate what's going on. There are times where I just don't know who the person is, and that's in fault of the commentators because they don't know who the hell it is, especially JR. That's inexcusable. Especially if you're doing commentary on the TV shows too weekly. How the hell do you not know who these guys are? How the hell do you not know some of the stories and some of the angles? It's ridiculous. This just flat out, for so many different reasons, felt like a much lesser show than night one. And frankly, at times, really frustrated me and kind of encapsulated so much of what frustrates me about modern professional wrestling today. Whether it's WWE, whether it's any other American company, New Japan, doesn't matter. So much of this shit that I saw on this show just reminds me of how aggravated at times I get with wrestling today. Like, you look at the opening tag match. Team Liger versus the Tempura Boys and Yoshitatsu. Yay, save Yoshitatsu. But seriously, you're in the opening match. It's not for the titles of any kind. There's no real major story here, is there? I wouldn't know because it wouldn't fucking bother to educate me anyways. But you're in the opening match. Know your goddamn role. Stop doing top rope flips and fucking dives in the opening match. That's stupid. Your job is to get the people settled into their seats and to start the night off. Stop trying to go out there and work it like it's a goddamn main event for every single tag title in the universe. That's stupid. Nobody bothered to get any fucking heat on anybody. We're just getting our shit in. And while people are going to talk about the triple submission finish look cool, it's just like everything else in this match. It missed the mark. Clearly, the fans are really behind Jushin Thunder Liger. Work the legend angle here. Get heat on somebody on his fucking team. And then work the hot tag for Jushin Thunder Liger. And then if you want to have one of the other young dudes go over here, so be it. That's fine. But the way you did it was just so ridiculous and so unnecessary. It's great if you can do spots, but if you don't have to, why do them? And if the crowd is leading you in a direction that you don't need to do them, then ultimately, why do them? And this is, again, talking about the pre-planning of matches. Everybody wants to get their shit in. Instead of actually truly working a match and truly working the crowd, we get forgettable opening tag matches like this. Speaking of working, you got the first of the semifinal matches in this U.S. Uh, title tournament. Jay Lethal, Kenny Omega. The start of it was great in the sense of Jay Lethal's trying to hit the home run shot. He's trying to hit it early. With the ribs, that makes a lot of sense. You want to go for broke early because if you win... You know, you know you have another match later on in the night. So from a storyline standpoint, from a logic standpoint, it makes all the sense in the world. You want to end it early to have as much time to recover, take as little damage and wear and tear to your ribs as possible, and try to get prepared for the next fight. That makes all the sense of the world. And, and the thing is, the fans are buying the story. Like, you're documenting. You got the bandages there with Jay Lethal on his ribs. Um, you start working it early. Every time Kenny Omega hits him with a right hand in the ribs, the crowd goes, ooh. Every time he hits him with a forearm shiver and elbow in the ribs, everybody goes, ah. Oh. And then when he kicks him there, it's like, ooh, ah. Oh. The point I'm getting at here is you've got the built-in story. You've got the angle to work the whole freaking match. Why would you bother doing any high-risk shit at all? 
And I will say this for Kenny Omega. He was relatively consistent in terms of trying to work the ribs. Occasionally, he kind of went off the reservation and to me did shit that he just didn't need to. It just wasn't required. It just wasn't necessary. Now, if you listen to cucks like Dave Meltzer, they will tell you that this makes him so great and so awesome. I say no. He could actually be great and awesome if he would sit there and be a little more consistent and not at times just kind of stray off and just do this wild and random shit and then try to come back home. And Jay Lethal, I blame him for this match. He was terribly inconsistent selling the ribs. Like, literally, and for somebody like me, who at times has really bad back pain, you know, there are days when it, when I'm feeling it and it's hurting, everything I do is a struggle. Everything I do hurts, and you can usually see it on my face. But Jay Lethal, talking about his ribs, and if you've ever had a rib injury, you know how painful that can be just to breathe. Sometimes after he hits a move, he doesn't sell anything about the ribs. He's acting like nothing's fucking wrong. Adrenaline my ass. Ribs are ribs. They're going to fucking hurt you no matter what. Other times he does. I thought Omega was much better in this match than Jay Lethal, period. And this match could have been so much more than it actually was because ultimately, instead of really working, especially in the case of Jay Lethal, we just wanted to sit there and get all of our shit in. Again, just because you can doesn't mean you should. The crowd is leading you in the direction of they're buying the story by doing basic shit. Then do the basic shit. And maybe mix in one spectacular thing. Stop trying to go crash test on me. It's stupid. Thankfully, we followed that up with Tomohiro Ishii and Zack Sabre Jr. It was funny throughout the weekend, you could see between the two nights that Ishii was definitely a sentimental favorite. Definitely. And frankly, when it comes to this match, I enjoyed the hell out of this match. I don't know quite as much as Ishii versus Naito in night one, but this match is a match that a lot of these people, frankly, in New fucking Japan could learn something from. And people in the business in general could learn something from. Isn't it amazing if you actually work a match and you actually work on something, in this case, Ishii selling an arm injury or that his arm is bad, you know, Saber trying to break him down in terms of the submission stuff. Uh, Ishii selling the fact that he's got a hard head and he's going to hit Saber with it at times. And other times he's going to no-sell it and showing you how you no-sell the right way. Isn't it amazing when you actually work a match and you stick to these gimmicks in the match and you work certain components of the match and you slow the fuck down and you make things matter and you make things have consequence, how much more interested the crowd is? Like, this isn't like, you know, certain junior tag team champions on this fucking show that sit there and the only way they can get a reaction is to do spot monkey shit because that's the only way they can get a reaction because they fucking suck. Ishii and Saber can get a reaction off of a freaking headbutt and the potential is Zack Saber submitting Ishii. It was one of the loudest roars of the night was when the crowd didn't want Ishii to submit to Saber. And in the land of spots, especially which was kind of the clusterfuck of night two here, this was a match that really, really stood out. Ishii won. It was outstanding to me. Uh, maybe I'm becoming an Ishii mark. I don't know. But I enjoyed the hell out of this particular match. The first two matches, and not so much. Like I said, although, to be fair, I thought Omega was much better than Jay Lethal in, match, in the second match. I really did. Ishii versus Sabre Jr., really good stuff. It's funny though with Saber Jr. He looks like he's six foot four compared to some of the guys in Japan, but apparently he's only like six foot. But he looks really funky. Dude needs to put on some weight. I'm just saying. Because imagine if he did wrestle at even like 215, 220 pounds. Just how big of a deal he could fucking be. Because I'm a fan of his ring work, and I'm definitely obviously a fan of Ishii's work. I love this match. But then, of course, we go right back into another fucking random ass tag match, a 10 man tag that I frankly. Can barely remember half of the people involved. This match was a complete clusterfuck. There's no need to book everybody on this goddamn card. Again, as I referenced earlier in this video, sometimes less is more. The crowd didn't really care. They didn't care for the finish because, again, it's too many multi-man tags. You're just trying to get shit in. Nobody's working anything. If you wanted to have a tag match here, then maybe it should have been something like Naito and Takahashi versus Juice and maybe Sonata. That way you have four guys, the four guys you probably care about the most in this match, or maybe three of the four guys you care about the most in this match, and you can actually try to do something. And the fans will actually have the ability to 
take notes. Yeah, this 10-man match was terrible. I remember shit about it. That's not good. I should be able to, the night after watching it, remember something about it. I literally don't remember anything about it. Nothing. I think Naito and Takahashi's team won. I think that might be literally the only thing I remember. Then we follow that right back up with another fucking six-man tag. At least you could say this ties into night one. It's War Machine and Michael Elgin against Haku's kids and Hangman Page. Big pop for seeing Haku. That's for damn sure. But this match, again, in the land of so many multiple man tag matches, uh, just is kind of lost in the schmaz. Although I definitely enjoyed it more than the opening six-man tag. I enjoyed it much more than the ten-man tag. At least there was some reason for it. Again, I look at... Tama, I look at Tonga, and I just look at it, and I see big potential with these guys. And again, it was cool to see Haku um, out there rocking the Bullet Club shit, I guess. It's just, it's fucking Haku. Does it need to be said any more than that? Um, but again, we did just see these guys in night one. Did we necessarily need to see them in night number two? I don't know. Like I said, the match was okay. It was okay. And then we get to the disaster of the night for me. The farce of the night for me. The big steaming pile of crap of the night for me. Of course, it would come from the Bucks of Suck, the Young Bucks. This junior tag team championship match was a steaming pile of shit. Period. Those of you that support these fucks, shame on you. Those of you that like these fucks, have your standards lowered that much? Are your attention spans that short? Have you lost your way that much? Or are you that new to wrestling where you actually think that this shit is okay? This match was stupid on so many different fucking levels. As I referenced earlier, Kenny Omega is getting a reaction from using a right hand to hit a dude in the ribs. Like an ooh, an ah, and you're building off of that. Ishii and Sabre are getting the crowd invested Throughout the entire match, not just when something big happens, but there's actually a legitimate buzz and aura in the building throughout the entire match that's building and building and building to the crescendo of when Ishii ultimately goes over, the fans go fucking crazy. But now with these young bucks idiots, and not with Trent Beretta and his partner, we just want to go out there and crash test dummy and do a bunch of spots for 20 odd fucking too long minutes. Literally the only reason the young bucks get a reaction is because they'll do a high spot. Then nobody cares. Then they'll do a high spot. Then nobody cares. Then they'll do a high spot. Then nobody fucking cares. That's not fucking wrestling. That's gymnastics, karate, bullshit. So let me get this straight. If I go get Tasteless Tony T or Mr. Route and I put a big old fucking wrestling ring in my front yard and we sit there and record it and we do every single fucking spot as the Young Bucks, then that makes us a great fucking wrestling tag team too. Get the fuck out of here. Fuck you. These dudes are fucking bums. They fucking suck. It's stupid to work a style of match like this because nothing that you do matters. Nothing has any consequence. And what's ridiculous about it is all the risky shit they do. All the athletic moves that they do. And that's the thing. These kids are really fucking athletic. So why not back off of some of this dumb shit? Actually learn how to fucking really work a match so that way when you do something like the melty driver or some of the other shit that you do instead of doing 500 super fucking super kicks because you're lazy fuckers that don't know how to work imagine how much more your matches would stand out imagine how much better the crowd would be invested throughout the whole match instead of just waiting for you to get to the next fucking spot to see how can we top this I'm sorry, but if you've seen one Young Bucks match, you've fucking seen them all. Why? Because there is no story. It's just a bunch of hodgepodge of bullshit. No, the Young Bucks aren't fucking deserving of your worship and your adulation. There are other people on this roster and throughout wrestling that actually know how to fucking work. These guys couldn't work their way out of a fucking paper bag. And it's clear to see. Because we don't fucking sell anything. It's all literally get to a spot to get to the next spot to get to the fucking next spot. And each time you look at a spot and you're like, oh my god, that's crazy. Then they try to do something to outdo themselves to the point where you're like, oh, come on, get the fuck over it. To the point where you've got people, you're doing this fucking one dude, one buck's fucking jumping off the top rope. You're driving the other dude's head into the damn mat and we're kicking out of that shit? 
At what point in time do people understand that these guys aren't helping the cause of professional wrestling, they're hurting it by making it look like fake choreographed spot monkey bullshit? And that's exactly what this fucking looked like. Fake choreographed spot monkey bullshit. We all know wrestling is scripted and fake, but we at least want to be able to suspend some level of disbelief. And when they do to the level of what they do consistently each and every single time, because again, each and every single match these fuck sticks work is exactly the same. And I use that term work very loosely because again, they couldn't work their way out of a fucking paper bag. Can't get the fans interested until they do something stupid or crazy. That's not working. Anybody can fucking do that. Literally, anybody can fucking do that. And a lot of people that would not be as physically able would actually be better at it because they would, at least they would sell those moves with some type of fucking consequence. So this whole match was a fucking joke and a half. Strong style my ass, whatever the hell you want to talk about. Ooh, it's about differences. There are different types of styles. Some people work a more map based Some people work technical. Some people can work high flying. But imagine if somebody like a Shawn Michaels or a Macho Man Randy Savage or so many other high flyers throughout the years literally only did high flying shit the entire fucking match. No, those guys still knew how to work a fucking match. They still knew how to piece together a match. They knew how to tell a goddamn story. They knew how to get heat. They knew how to work an angle within a damn match to work a story within a goddamn match. They knew how to set up to their high spots. To where they actually meant something. They had meaning, significance, and consequence. Everything that these retards, Matt and Nick, fucking can't do and never will be able to do because they don't bother to do because they got cucks like Dave Meltzer sucking their dicks talking about how great they are. Oh my God, they named a move after me, the Meltzer driver. Look at me almost 60 years old being a fucking mark for this New Japan bullshit because I'm on the fucking payroll. And then of course all these other people that are influenced by this fucking cuck sit there and cuck themselves and try to argue talking about, well, it's just different. You're an angry old man yelling at the clouds. Well, you know what? Maybe I am an angry old man yelling at the clouds. But you could do spots and shit and bother to actually work a fucking match. This is stupid. Even backyard feds have better matches than this because at least they try as terribly as they typically do to tell some type of a story. At least there is some type of consequence. At least the guys in those matches a lot of times will actually sell getting hit in the head with a fluorescent fucking light bulb. Nick and Matt do this shit. They'll get hit in the head with a fucking light bulb and then they'll try to do like some type of 720 fucking flip into a Meltzer driver into something that's flaming shards of ass glass into something where you literally land on each other's neck. These idiots suck so bad they wouldn't even sell a fucking broken neck. That's how bad they suck. Fuck this match. And then even afterwards, like at least Trump Beretta throughout the course of the match is selling the back, selling the back, selling the back. But one person was bothering to sell any fucking thing at all this entire time. Once the match is over and you have this post-match promo, all of a sudden Trent Beretta's back doesn't fucking hurt him anymore. He's showing no signs of anguish after going through 300 plus fucking spots. Neither one of the dudes that are left in the ring that just lost to the no Young Bucks are showing any type of physical wear or tear, any types of strain any types of struggle or pain or anything whatsoever. You just basically once again pointed out how fake this bullshit is. You said all of this flips and crap, it was all fake. There's no consequence, it doesn't hurt at all. I'm gonna stand straight up like it doesn't fucking matter. And again, for somebody like me who deals with back pain off and on pretty consistently, I know how painful that shit is. I'm not no selling shit. Even when I don't want to sell that my back is hurting, my back is still fucking hurting. So for him to sit there and sell the back throughout the entirety of the match for the most part, and then all of a sudden once the match is over, we forget it even fucking happened. Give me a fucking break to all four of these guys in this match. One big fuck you. This suck. Minus 10 stars. Eat my ass. So those of you who want to get your flaming keyboard fingers of fire ready in the comment section, go ahead and then go fuck yourselves. You know this is shit. You have other worthy talents to cheer for on this show. I'll throw in Omega because when he doesn't get caught up in the bullshit, he can actually work a fucking match. You've got Ishii, you've got Sabre Jr., you've got fucking Naito, Takahashi, you know, whoever the case might be. Some of these people that can actually bother to work. Why would you waste time getting behind the bucks of suck? They fucking suck. They expose the business even more as the fake, fancy bullshit that marks like them fucking would. Unbelievable. Unbelievable we had to waste this much time talking about it, but unbelievable this match never fucking ended. There, and you have no, again, no semblance of what's going on in the match because nothing ever builds upon itself. 
It's literally just a spot to get to a spot to get to a spot to get to a spot. Is it any surprise that in the 300 fucking plus spots these idiots do in a fucking match and they do some dumbass submission finish that doesn't go over very well because after all of this shit, that's what's going to fucking finish the match? Literally based off of the Young Bucks style. The only two ways a finish of their match really truly gets over or should get over is somebody either needs to end up in the hospital or the fucking cemetery. And if you think that's professional wrestling, then I don't know what the fuck to tell you. Anyways, moving on from the Bucks of Suck and their piece of crap that they are. This six-man tag, again, talking about another multi-man tag. But I will point out something that emphasizes my point. This six-man tag, there are two things I remember about it. Will Ospreay drinking a beer in the crowd... So all the spectacular shit he does, like the spectacular movie he did in fucking not, night one, that was just one spot in this match of a hundred fucking spots. I remember more in night two, him going into the crowd and drinking a beer. And then Okada body slamming the big fucking dude, whatever the fuck his name is. Big, big boy, Bali, whatever the fuck it is. Point being, you notice how Okada, now mind you, Okada is much more over than the Young Bucks because Okada is much better than the Young Bucks and Okada actually knows how to work when he wants to, unlike the fucking Young Bucks. But do you notice how Okada got ten times the reaction for a fucking body slam than the Young Bucks do for their 500 fucking super kicks to go into a flaming shards of ass glass Meltzer driver? Anybody notice that? Now, I really don't remember much else about this. And, and that's fine. At least I remember something from it. But I remember how big of a reaction Okada, who's really over with this fan base, really over with this crowd, who night one was really all about. It's amazing what a reaction he got for a fucking body slam. Again, just because you can do a bunch of spectacular spots doesn't mean you should. Doesn't mean you need to. Doesn't mean the match calls for it. Okada got more over in that particular match. He got a bigger pop for doing a body slam than 90% of the guys for doing flips and kicks on this fucking show. What does that tell you? Anyways, moving on to the Intercontinental Championship match between Billy Gunn and Tanahashi. I'm still confused why Billy Gunn is there. I mean, it was cool to see him at night one, I guess. But I'm just wondering, of all the people, why he felt badass Billy Gunn was a fit here to face Tanahashi on night two for this you know, important title. Um, I'm sure because it doesn't have 300 bucks of sucks, flips, and kicks that a lot of New Japan fans and some of the uh, pro wrestling media are going to shit on this and talk about it was the worst match of the night. I don't think it was the worst match of the night. I don't know it was very good, but I don't think it was a steaming pile of shit. These guys at least tried to work. They at least tried to make what they do had consequences, had meaning. They at least tried to tell a story. Now, was the crowd necessarily buying the story? Were they that into it? I don't really know. But you could sense there was an undercurrent of resentment to Billy Gunn, and he was going in there clearly working as the heel. And he worked being the heel. Tanahashi worked being the face. Tanahashi goes over. It was good enough. It, it's one of these things that... It's maybe a weird... Uh, way to showcase one of your biggest names of Tanahashi, but at least you got him here on night number two in a solo match so he could shine a little bit. But when all said and done, it wasn't about him. This night wasn't about him. Where night one of the G1 USA special was about Okada, night two was ultimately all about, frankly, Ishii and, of course, Kenny Omega, which leads me to the main event. I will at least say this, as so often is the case, if a lot of your show is crap, but the main event is good. That will usually save a show for me. It doesn't mask everything. It doesn't take away all the other crap. But it helps. And Ishii versus Omega was outstanding. Outstanding. I actually enjoyed this match more than either one of the two Omega Okada matches. That's just me, maybe. Maybe there'll be some others that agree. Maybe there'll be some others that don't. But I really, really like this match. I thought Omega really shined here. I thought Ishii really shined here. And with some of the stuff that they did in the match, you know, and Ishii showing you when you no-sell that you build up to the no-sell and you make the no-sell count and the no-sell can be effective. The no-sell can actually sell people on the concept, the story, the gimmick of the fucking match. 
You know, like when you had the table spot and they worked it and they worked it and they built up to it. It wasn't one of these things like, oh, we put up a table, let's immediately fucking go through it and then we'll bounce right back up like nothing fucking happened. Like these guys took time once the table was set up. They took time to build to it. They were teasing it, they were teasing it, and they were teasing it. And then when they finally did it, frankly, that shit looked brutal. I'm surprised one or both of those guys didn't get seriously fucked up going through that table, especially Omega, Jesus Christ. But then they just laid there and they just sat there Again, if the crowd's in it, if the crowd is popping, frankly, laying there is the best thing you could do. Don't immediately follow up and go into another series of moves to lead to another fucking high spot. Don't do that. Lay your ass down. Get the breather that you need, that you want, and let the crowd build the anticipation and the energy level of the match. Even though going into this match that I knew all along that... with. In, let me say this. It had already been spoiled for me anyways. But even, you know, after Saturday night, I'm like, maybe Ishii faces Omega in the final, but there's probably a 99.99% chance that Omega's winning this match here because he's a Canadian. So, of course, in California, we've got to have him win the first ever U.S. title. I guess because he's a white guy, that's close enough. Hey, if that logic works for WWE, it can work for New Japan too in this case because all the white guys look the same, right? Anyways, um, but you can see the, the whole concept of the night was building towards Kenny Omega. This was supposed to be Kenny Omega's night. Again, of course, the fucking Young Bucks are out there because they fucking suck. What the fuck are they out there for? What the hell did they do? Get these attention hogs the fuck out of there and let the real star, in this case, Kenny Omega and Ishii, have their match. The only thing that surprised me was you waited until after the match to have Cody Rhodes come out and then we're just hugging and everything is okay. I thought that was kind of stupid in a way, but maybe you do it because you tease it, and then you back off, and then you really dive into it later, whatever. But this match was really, really good. I'm not the biggest Omega fan, but I'm not just going to unfairly shit on somebody for the sake of unfairly shitting on somebody and not give them credit when something is good. I'd be much more inclined to do that with the Young Bucks because they don't do good shit. Omega can do some good shit, and I think it really benefits from working with somebody like Ishii because it slows him down a little bit. It forces him to do the good things that he can do, the spectacular shit that he can do, and make it count and have meaning and significance and work from this to work to that to work to that instead of just going wing, bam, boom, bam, boozle. I love this match. I thought it was a really, really good main event. It was much better than the main event we got on night one. I don't know that it was the match of the weekend. I still think that might have been Ishii versus Naito on night one. Um, I thought Omega was a star of the night. Ishii was a sentimental favorite and a big star of the night. Um, and Zack Sabre really shined nicely here as well. But in all honesty, that's pretty much it. You know, Okada was kind of a bit player on this night, and that's okay. But he at least had a moment that I will fucking remember. And this is the problem again. When you have too many matches... With too many guys, too many people work the same style of shit, nothing has any meaning, purpose, or consequence. It all becomes kind of a schmoz, and it's hard to remember anything that went on. I thought the flow of night one was much better. I thought, frankly, some of the action in night one was much better. And I thought the pacing was much better. Night two just wasn't a good culmination to G1, in my opinion. If you were going to watch anything on this show... Watch Ishii versus Sabre and watch the main event with Ishii and Omega. Those two matches are definitely worth your time. Frankly, the rest of this crap, if you align with me in your thought process in any way, shape, or form, is largely skippable on this event. It is. Sorry, New Japan fans. It's the truth. So that's what I thought of night two of the G1 special. You're welcome to chime in in the comments with your thoughts. And for those of you that haven't already, make sure you subscribe to this channel. We're trying to hashtag make wrestling fun again in 2017. And, and, and we're going to do it, by God. We're going to do it. So I thank you for your time. This has been the Schleg Daddy here at OTR Essential, where we're not the wrestling show you want, just the wrestling show you need. Goodbye, everybody.